I'm Jacob from the Cedar Rapids Public Library, and today we're going to be making sourdough. Hopefully. It's much too soon to tell. Sourdough has had something of a resurgence in the last year. In a time of increased isolation from the world and one another, it makes a sort of sense that we would find ourselves investing time and resources into something that, while most definitely alive, carries with it very little heartache should things actually go wrong. Wait, is keeping sourdough kind of like keeping a Tamagotchi but for people over 30? Anyway, today we're going to be making sourdough. Dating back over 3,500 years, sourdough is believed to be the first leavened bread to ever be created by humans. Aside from its ability to rise, sourdough is actually renowned for its sour and tangy flavors. But where did these flavors come from? Three things. Flour, water, and thyme. Together they create what is known as a pre-ferment, or a starter. A sourdough starter is a culture of microorganisms. Flour naturally contains innumerable numbers of them, largely bacteria and yeasts. When the water is added to the flour, the yeast slowly starts to produce an enzyme, known as amylase, that breaks down the starch in the flour and converts it into sugar, which can then be digested by the bacteria in the flour. When this process starts, there are untold numbers of various bacteria living amongst the flour. But over time, natural selection occurs. This natural selection is headed by what is known as lactic acid bacteria, or LABS. These bacteria produce lactic acid and are naturally found on the skin of fruits, vegetables, and all sorts of land and marine animals, including humans. The production of lactic acid lowers the pH of our starter to anything from about 3.5 to 5. A lower or more acidic pH eliminates the bad and unwanted bacteria because they can't survive in an acidic environment. This is the driving force behind lacto-fermentation, a preservation technique that produces foods like pickles, sauerkraut, and yogurt. A single sourdough starter will contain several different species of labs over the course of its lifetime. And some of them can not only produce lactic acid, but something called acidic acid as well. These two acids are an enormous part of what gives sourdough its flavors, with lactic acid giving the dough its sour flavor and acidic acid providing a sort of tang. The difference between them producing one acid versus another is only a matter of temperature, with lactic acid being produced when the temperature is generally above 70 degrees Fahrenheit and acidic acid when it is below. The final part of our starter is our yeast. Yeasts are single-celled microorganisms that make up about 1% of all funguses in the entire world. As I mentioned earlier, when water is added to flour, yeast slowly start to produce an enzyme that breaks down the starch in the flour and converts it into sugar. When yeasts consume these sugars, they multiply and produce carbon dioxide gas bubbles. These gas bubbles expand the dough within the starter, and when baked at high temperatures, actually expand even farther, which with any luck results in a bread that is both airy and soft. Now that we understand how sourdough works on paper, let's see if we can get it to actually work ourselves. First, we're going to take two one liter jars and fill them each with one cup of flour. I'm choosing to make two, that way we have a backup in case anything strange happens. Next, we're going to add about half a cup of water and stir until we get as much of the flour mixed in as possible. I actually ended up adding an extra tablespoon of water just because of how much flour seemed unable to mix into our starter. Once our starter is properly mixed, we're going to close the lids of our jars and let the bacteria and yeast do their thing for about 24 hours. So after one day, you can see they became sort of dry. It's abundantly clear I should have either entirely sealed the jars or put a damp paper towel over them in order to keep the moisture in. Still, we have our carbon dioxide bubbles from our yeast, so things are going pretty good. For our next step, we are going to discard all but half of a cup of our starter. Add half a cup of lukewarm water before adding half a cup each of whole wheat and unbleached bread flour, and then mixing it all together. This is going to provide additional food for our budding sourdough starter. Now, you may be asking why are we adding one cup of flour but only half a cup of water? The answer is a matter of volume versus weight. Volume is a measure of the amount of space something takes up, while weight is a measurement of an object's heaviness. In this case, we need to have an equal weight of water and flour in order to avoid overhydrating our starter. One cup of water weighs 236 grams, while one cup of flour weighs 125 grams. So we can reasonably cut the volume of water in half and end up with approximately the same weight of both. Now, ordinarily, after the first feeding, we would let the starter sit for another full 24 hours. Unfortunately, after just 12, it seems the more active of our two starters decided to double down by expanding well past its jar and all over my kitchen counter. Realizing that the other starter's container was also more than a little bit dirty, we transferred just over half a cup of each into a new and more importantly clean jar before vigorously washing the dirty ones and then transporting them back into their original homes. Could I have let them stay in their new jars? Easily, but that would have been rewarding bad behavior. Next, we're going to repeat the feeding process from yesterday, so we can hopefully get back some of our starter. Then from here, we pretty much repeat the same ritual every 12 hours for the next four to five days. 
over that time, we will watch our starter rise, fall, get hungry, fed, rise again, overflow, fall a, a lot. Just a lot happened. One of the most interesting things is this right here. You see that liquid kind of hanging out on the top? That is what is known as hooch. It is an alcohol that the starter makes when it has eaten all of its nutrients and requires feeding. It does not, as I originally feared, mean you have destroyed your starter, which after 10 minutes of panic googling was very nice to hear. Now, even though a decent starter can take a couple weeks to form, ours has been so explosively enthusiastic over the last week that I figured it was only fair we put it to the test as soon as it started to smell sour. But before we can use our starter, we need to make sure we have enough for our recipe. So we are going to skip the discard step and simply add another cup of unbleached white flour and half a cup of water and let it sit for two to three hours. Over that time, the starter will metabolize the flour and expand enough in size we should have more than enough for our recipe. The first thing we're going to do is measure out a cup or about 227 grams of our starter. From there, we're going to add five cups of unbleached bread flour, two and a half teaspoons of salt, two teaspoons of yeast to help our budding sourdough grow, before finally adding a cup and a half of lukewarm water. Then we're going to knead the dough until smooth. Once that is done, we're going to set the dough aside to rise in a lightly greased covered bowl for 90 minutes, or until it is about doubled in size. After that, we're going to divide the dough into approximate halves, shape them into at least something vaguely resembling oval loaves, then place them on a parchment lined baking sheet and cover them for an additional hour so they can rise. About 20 minutes before the end of our second rising, we're going to preheat the oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. Once that is done, we're going to uncover our loaves, spray them with some lukewarm water, and dust them liberally with flour. That accomplished, it is time to make two deep diagonal cuts into our loaves to allow them easy expansion while baking, before finally putting them in the oven for about 30 minutes. After all that, we are left with these. Two beautiful, if slightly misshapen, loaves of sourdough bread. And here is kind of what the inside of our bread looks like. As you can see, the bubbles that we have here are actually quite small, showing that the yeast in our starter hasn't developed the complex matrices required to produce a truly airy loaf of bread. Add to that the very small amount of sourness actually present in the bread itself, and it's clear that our starter just isn't mature enough to actually make sourdough proper. Still, it's early days. Time will tell how much depth of flavor our starter will eventually develop. The worst that can be said is that we have a bread that's dense, but delicious in a way that only fresh baked bread can be. Thanks for watching.